go into what our archives are now and we're hoping that as this project progresses that it's just going to get better and better and better. Um, I think we've already had some people come in who um, have done a little research over there and uh, hopefully I've found a few goodies that will help them uh, in their historical and genealogical research. Uh, but without further ado, Mr. Tim Barnard. I wasn't exactly sure how, you know, what we were coming to or how this was going to work. So uh, I'm glad I'm comfortable in speaking in front of groups. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this actually started probably early last summer with a call from Mr. Criswell. Um, they were involved in the uh, um, moving the records over here and trying to select what records were brought over here, uh, working with Mr. McBride and the uh, circuit clerk, Randy Griggs. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, you, you did get a copy of this. I did. Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> and I have it. Okay, because both times we came by the office, you were somewhere else. <laughs> uh, these elected officials are busy. Anyway, uh, what what they were wanting us to do is sort of help them, um, let me back up just a little bit. The um, Genealogical Society of Utah had come in here a few years ago and started uh, imaging some of the older chance records. They have been doing this literally all over the world. And um, they're actually starting a, a probate project that um, if Rodney were here, I would I would ask him if he got my letter yet, because uh, we're, in, we're getting involved in that. But uh, <clears throat> Mr. Criswell said they wanted to pick up where the Mormons had left off, trying to decide what to image, uh, what records, and so on, and just exactly how to do it. Well, I used to work down in Harrison County on the coast in the Chancery Clerk's office. Back in 2001, uh, there was a uh, Mormon couple from in our office, they were there for 14 months with our chancery files. So one of the things that we learned from them, and I thought this would, this would be the first thing, preparing documents such as court files for microfilming. They, they were actually microfilming. You guys are imaging, which is, you know, the same result with different technology. So I brought this. I, uh, he did a little lecture for us one day, and I wrote it down and I brought this for for you guys. This is your copy and you can make as many copies as you want. Uh, tells you how to uh, unfold the paper and flatten out, get rid of staples and things like that so it's ready to microfilm. Uh, he had a nice little fancy machine. Uh, it, was a, it was a table with a bunch of holes in it. And he had a fan underneath the machine, under, underneath the table. And so the fan would pull air down, and he'd bring the, he'd have all his pages over here, the microfilm camera here, he'd slide it over, and that fan would hold that paper flat, and then he'd slide it on past. I don't have instructions for that, but anyway, it's an idea that you guys may, may consider as you, you know, it's, it was a production thing from that, for them. Like I said, they were there for 14 months. The filming didn't actually take that long, but a lot of the preparation did. They also had a, uh, a Rubbermaid tub, and I got pictures of this, with a little basket in it. And they would put about an inch of water in the bottom of the basket. They would put the folded up cork files in, that, in the basket, uh, inside the tub, and close it up. And after about two days, it was distilled water, it would get the paper just moist enough that they could unfold it and flatten it out without it being all crumbly. And then they had a, a book press that looked <coughs> like this. And this is all stuff that they handmade for our, to work in our office. So I'm, there's enough instructions here that you guys could do this too. Um, they would take the, they would put the papers in the, Containers for about two days, then they flatten them out, put them in the book press, 
and keep it there for three or four days, and the pressure would actually dry the pages back out. And they would be, they would then be flat just like this, so that you could film them. So this is my, this is my treat to you. No charge for that. <laughs> On the, the how part of, of preparing the documents so that you can film them. Now, um, we have been going around to, let's see, we will be in County 67 next week. We have been going all, of, all over the state inventorying the records from 1920 back in each county. And uh, when Mr. Criswell called, Tippa County was going to be in this one group that we were working on for this year. Uh, we moved it up so we could get the inventory and get the inventory back to you guys sooner. Uh, by doing that, we actually came to this county first in, in, our, in this particular realm. And about a month ago, we delivered this book. Uh, Felicia has a copy of it. Uh, the certain chancellor clerk both have copies. And uh, I think that's all. I think we left one. Yeah, there's, there's one here. Yeah, there's one here. Yeah, that's right. So there's one here, too. That's right. We did four. Um, this is our report on what records you have from 1920 back. And that includes what's in Chancery, what's in the circuit, what's upstairs in the courthouse, what's over here next door, anything that we could find. Um, we have a chart that we developed, and this will help you out. We looked at the value of the information and the frequency of the use of that information and said that things like the deed records and the marriage records have the highest value because those are the ones that people are going to look at trying to trace either property or family history or whatever. And so those have, we gave each one a value of one to three and when you add them together you get a six for those. There are a lot of other records that counties have and your county is just like everybody else. Uh, things that you have to keep forever, but the value of the information and how often they're going to be used is less. So when you decide what records you're going to image, you want to look at these with the values of five and six first. Uh, when you really have time to do the others, that's fine. Now the case files, I think there'd be a five the Chancery case files. The circuit may not quite as much because um, the type of cases they are. But there's still things of interest in there. You might find an old murder case or something like that. Uh, but the Chancery ones are going to be the ones that have the, the estates, the guardianships, the divorces, things like that that show you know, how, how people are related <coughs> and such like that. In the next section of the, of the uh, book, we've got these charts that show uh, it's a general idea of the records in each area. And this is where your value chart comes, your values come in. So they're, they're ranked from six on down to two. So that can help you determine which records have the more value and also which ones you want to move over here from the places in the courthouse where they're not as easily accessible. Like the... Uh, the attic behind the courtroom, which is not even air-conditioned, <clears throat> even though the, bit, the ducks go through there. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's we have a section in here on recommendations, so you might want to look at those and you know talk to your supervisors and such that have authority and money to do things. The circuit clerk and the chancery clerk just pretty much have to do what they have money for. <laughs> so it's the supervisors that have, the, have the, the money power. And here in the back is a book by book inventory of each record that we found in each location. Uh, it has a generic title. Sometimes it's more specific if it's, if it's unique. We, we had a list of like 240 common record title names that we, we have on an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, if it 
if it didn't fit that or it wasn't quite, then we'd put a more specific title in here. There's a book number and the month and year of the earliest record and the latest record in each book and the general condition of the book. So the ones that are in poor condition might be the ones you want to image first if you start imaging the books. Um, this is also, this goes through location by location. This is also on a, on a disc. Uh, you've got a copy in your book, and uh, the foundation has a copy too. It's, like I said, it's an Excel spreadsheet. The first page is the entire inventory of everything, and then there's a specific page for each location. You can actually take that, uh, download it into your computer, and add to it. Most of the, like I said, their drop down list, we can go through a county in about two days, most counties. So, uh, of course, we've been doing this for the last five years. But once you get used to the program, you can actually, we, don't, we had to stop at 1920 just because of the volume. But your records come up into, I know at least in the 1950s here. So um, you could bring that list forward. And it's, you know, with the drop down list and such, it's fairly easy to use. A uh, couple of summer students, somebody with just some time on your hands, you could do that. One person reads the information, and the other person puts it in the computer. Very simple. Like I said, we go through most counties in just a couple of days. So uh, we were here in Tippa County, I think, for two days. So, so this will help you. <coughs> decide what records and what um, priority to put on these records, which ones that you want to image first. Now, uh, Preston is our, he's from our, this is Preston Everett, he's from, he works in our image and sound division at our, uh, our section of the Archives and Record Services Division of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. So, he's the one that's over the imaging projects that we have at uh, various things at the archives, and he is the one that's the expert on how to do it. Mm -hmm. so we'll turn it over to you. Pardon me if I laugh on the expert part. <laughs> <laughs> By no means am I an expert. Um, Compared to the rest of us. I just do what, what we can do and do what we have the money with, and uh, uh, try to do as much as we can like I said, I'm Preston. I've uh, been working with the Archives Department for, actually this this Friday is my 20th anniversary at the Archives Department. I started um, right out of, actually while I was in college. And uh, I worked in the administration department for a little while, and once I saw the vault, I was up. Um, and I wondered what was behind the doors, and, and very many years later I was neck and what was behind those doors. <laughs> uh, like Tim was saying, I'm now in charge of the reformatting section. Um, we uh, microfilm and we also scan um, records uh, mainly. Uh, in our terms of our microfilming, we strictly uh, microfilm newspapers, newspaper titles throughout the state. And I'm, I'm a real soft talker. They don't let me out much. So <laughs> if, if you can't hear me, just, just let me know. Um, uh, we micro mainly uh, newspapers. We have about 120 titles that we do. Um, our camera has been uh, has been uh, uh, broken for the past couple months. We haven't been able to do anything. And actually, we got our camera head back today, so I'm excited about you know the possibility of so us filming again. Um, we also have a very productive um, scanning project. And our project started. I think pretty much with the Sovereignty Commission um, records that we have. Um, that was the thing that we scanned the, the Sovereignty Commission records and after that we had uh, able to get some flatbed scanners and get more flatbed scanners and we were able to get an oversized scanner, it's called the Zoichel. Um, it scans uh, 35 by 50. We can scan oversized maps, uh, state docs, um, county records, uh, items like that. Um, and we also use uh, flatbed scanners. Um, uh, we use an Epson 10,000 XL, and it's size uh, 12 by 17. 
we um, we were we was telling him earlier that the camera that you have in place, you actually are a little ahead of us. <laughs> and mean, and well, I say that because we have looked into that, getting a still camera, digital camera. We haven't done that yet. We closed our. I went close is a harsh word. We we lost our uh, technician that did dark room. We still have a dark room. It's a very good dark room, but we haven't used it in several years. And we want to get a digital <coughs> camera in place for doing certain uh, documents, uh, documentations. There's some things that you just do not want to put on a flatbed um, because of the condition. And I know all of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there's some things you don't want to put on an oversized scanner or you know, put on different types of equipment. You want to be able to film like with a still camera. So it's, it's really good, really good technology. Um, and looking upstairs, the only thing I would recommend is um, if you're going to do in that room, I would um, cover up the windows because of glare. Um, it, you kind of want as much as you can a consistency and because if you're if you have an imager that's doing that throughout the day the sun is going to go down and you're going to have a different uh, look to your your, your uh, documents and your images and also your photographs. Um, I know um, I was talking to you about the, <laughs> about the um, possibility of having a flatbed. I do recommend a flatbed. It, it, flatbed and cameras go almost hand in hand, but what a flatbed can do, it can do really good for uh, prints, negatives, um, glass slides. There's a wide range of items that you can get. And that you have such a great facility and you have storage, I imagine that you're going to start getting some collections in here. And once word gets out, you're going to fill up pretty fast. So if, um, if you can uh, start imaging that, and I really recommend a flatbed because it can do, it can be very versatile. You can do paper, you can do um, negatives, prints, slides, um, and it can do a pretty high resolution too. Uh, we, we scan at, um, on our flatbed, we scan at, uh, for paper, 300 PPI, that's pixels per inch. Uh, for uh, photographs, we scan at 600 PPI, and for negatives, we scan at 800 PPI. Uh, that's a really large file, but we're, and David will mention that a little bit, is that what we're able to do. Basically, the, the call is you want to scan your items as high as you can based on the storage that you have. So if you have a small uh, portable hard drive or something like that, that's maybe 500 gigs or maybe a couple terabytes, just take that into relation to how, much, how high you're scanning and try to make really concrete decisions on before you start. Because if you, because you don't want to, you don't want to get midway and say, hey, we're almost out of storage and we need to start lowering down what we're scanning. But all your stuff at the beginning, you've already done really, at a, it's already a certain high level. So kind of really look at, you know, your possibilities and how much storage space that you have. Um, what else I was going to say? Um, I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, the collections that we have scanned. I don't know if you're familiar with our website. It's www.mdah.state.ms.us. It's very long. But if you just go on the search engine, just type in MDAH, I think we're the second. The first one is something about medical or something. Um, we, uh, we scan on average um, <coughs> per month between 1,200 and 2,000 items a month. Um, uh, Northfield Society of Utah blows us completely out of the water, but we, we, what we're doing right now are a lot of slides and a lot of negatives, and it takes a lot longer to prep that and to also scan that. Um, what, we, what we've done, if you look on our website, I'd say about 70, maybe 60, 70 percent that you see on there came from our section um, that's on our website. <coughs> We have the Cooper postcard collection. It's 4,800 postcards that um, we scanned. Um, we uh, have done uh, the, all the constitutions, including 1890 constitution. Um, we scanned a lot of photograph collections. Um, we just completed, and that was last year or the year before, we did a, uh, <coughs> what's the name of the Titian Nino State Park? Uh, the Park? 
Worsham? Worsham. The Worsham yeah, collection is a it's one of my favorites. It's um, and it, to me it's really rare because uh, it showed the construction of the Tishomingo State Park. Um, I'm a really huge fan of the Tishomingo State Park. My wife and my two kids we say we go up there every, uh, weekend every year, <coughs> and we came across this uh, collection and it shows the uh, construction of the bridge, the construction of the, the uh, cabins, the swimming pool. And it shows the workers and also the, their campsite where they stayed while they were working on it. Um, so we do a lot of a lot of things like that. Um, oh, in terms of uh, software, <laughs> we, use, we use Photoshop CS5. What we do is we have our document and it's already been prepared. It's already been ready for scanning. Well, my section doesn't handle that. It comes from a different area of the archives department when it comes to us. Um, we scan it, um, we do a little bit of paperwork just to track everything because we're, we're currently working on about six different collections at the same time. And uh, we scan it at the certain PPI that we decide upon and we use uh, um, Photoshop CS5 in terms of doing our work on the actual scans. Uh, but we, we do it per scan. We'll do a scan, load up the software, um, and we'll do some cropping. We'll do so a lot of metadata, and they would may mention a little bit about the metadata. The metadata is pretty much um, they call it data about data, which is you know, what they will scan, what machine, what machine scanned it, who did the scanning, um, the date that it was scanned, um, also the PPI, the resolution, and everything like that, and also what type of scanner did the scanning. Um, but we do not do any enhancement. Little to nothing. We will scan um, something, and if if um, it was a little dark, a little bright, we don't we don't change it in any way because um, we, we we consider that we call it the master scan, which is the original scan. We want it exactly like we have it right now. Our our perspective on it is um, if you change that in any way, basically you recreate it and you have a new document. So if you have something, an image that's really faded, and you enhance it, basically have a new document. And for us, our main point of view is that it, that's sent out on the website, and someone will say, well, we want that one. Well, it may not exist, because we did enhancement on it, but the original is faded or whatnot. So we don't do uh, any enhancements. We do do some enhancements for public orders. When someone calls in a request and it's for a book or it's for something, we'll do a special request. But 99% of what we do, we, we do very, very little enhancements. We have one machine, the Soichel OS 11000, it's our oversized scanner. Um, it adds about 10% of a light red pink color. And we will go in and enhance that to take out that pink because it uh, was created. By the machine and not by the original document. So we do do enhancements in that, but other than that, we don't do we don't do any enhance, enhancements or whatnot. And what I mean by enhancements is just changing something, making it lighter, making it darker, change, messing around with the contrast. We don't do we don't do anything like that. Um, I can't. I don't know if it's law, but I can't recommend any equipment. But I can only tell you what we use. Um, like I said, we use the Epson, we use the, the Zoichel, and uh, eventually uh, we'll get into doing still cameras. Um, um, do you have any questions? So, and David, he is the um, section head for electronic records. The path, that, <coughs> the path that things go, for example, um, we have uh, our official records state documents and our state records. The path would be from that unit to get it prepped. We'll come to us, we image it, we scan it. Uh, we inspect it and make sure, um, doing all the inspections and want to make sure that it comes to specs. And then we transfer it to electronic records where David and his section become responsible for the actual files. Then we return the original documents and we transfer the digital documents. So it's his responsibility for um, the uh, the files themselves. We're kind
kind of a flow for a unit. Um, <coughs> people kind of make fun of me sometimes because they say, oh, you're nothing but Kinkos. But <laughs> I kind of, I like, think we're, you know, I mean, we don't do as much as they do, but, you know, we, 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 try, we try our best. And, uh, you have a great facility. Uh, you, have a, you have a lot of good uh, possibilities for some really good growth. Here. Um, I have a question concerning what we're doing here, will that, will we interface with you at the state level, or, I mean, there's no point in recreating the wheel, like if we finish our stuff, then, or will we have like an interconnection somehow, so that if somebody comes to the state level and asks for certain information that happens to be from Tippa County, that it would, that you would revert them to us, or how does that work? We, it, we have the microphone for Tip County, and I don't know exactly. Tim actually has it in his. It should uh, be. Yes, it's in the report here. Okay. In the report of what microfilm we have for Tip County. Sorry, and, page well, that's, 47. And that's strictly microfilm. Um, now, if we now if we get requests for that, we do copies um, at the archives department. If it's something that we have not found, we refer them back to the county. Uh, if it's something that um, it's, it's the imaging that you're doing, um, and if we get a request for it as scan something like that, you know, we would refer them, say that they're going through a scanning project or something that maybe already be scanned. That's something that you have. Also, GSU um, Family Search has also done you know, right. They they've done scanning, I believe, here, right. So you can also you know contact them. Um, I can't answer the question based on what the interface would be with the archives department because that's above me. <laughs> so, um, but I, I mean, I, I can definitely say that there's something that we do not have. We always refer to the county, mm -hmm. the patrons of the county, and if it's something that we, we, we have um, that we are scanning, you know, of course we always try to tell the county. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what Tim's, you know, position is. He's local government records, so if we're working on a project. That relates to a county, we let him know so he can let the, the clerks know that we do act out this. Um, so, I hope that answers your, your question. What about recouping time and expense? Any recommendations there? Uh, you, I would say that if you create, it's a little early, but if you create, if, I mean, you, you know, the historical society went to the expense of getting the equipment staffing you know to do that we have in place um, some to recoup our production costs only um, for like time to uh, scan something to make it available to a patron um, there's a possibility of that if you're bringing in collections so be really careful with how you do it make sure one that you get paperwork as much as you can about the person who brought in your material um, we call them contracts or gifts. Um, the, the shows that who brought it in, you know, contact information. Or I even like to draw right on the side. Who is your family? You know, so we can contact them if there's any response. You know, any, any questions or whatnot. And one greatest thing about the contract to gift is that they refer to you the copyright because you can't really do quite as much with it as you would like because of the copyright infringement. And you can. You know, scan it, and you can make it available here, but you can't legally give it to somebody for a production of book or whatever. So if you if you have the copyright and your donor has made an arrangement for that, you can recoup a little of the production cost um, in terms of the scanning or whatnot. But once again, it's a little above, above me. <laughs> Do you have a um, like a shell um, for for someone to sign? That gives you the right to yeah, yeah. reproduce. Mm -hmm. Could we get a copy we, of we it so we a, could maybe. When a patron yeah. comes in and donates a collection, we call it a contract to give. Mm -hmm. And it covers, it's, some of them are very elaborate, some of them are very basic. But basically it says, you know, this is the collection that we're donating. They agree to, you know, forwarding the copyright. And we also, <coughs> so that, that's that part. So if we have a patron that comes in and wants a copy of something, we have a thing called a uh, release form. Mm -hmm. Broad, it's called a broadcast release form. It says, I'm using this for this book. 
I want a cover to make put this on a cover of a book, and we we write out you know the terms of the book, you know, and the fact that we have the copyright for it, and also that you know, the <coughs> fees are in, that are involved. So we call it a broadcast release form. And, um, and that actually is on the on the website. On the website. Okay. Our contract is kept. I don't think is <coughs> the broadcast release. Sorry. We had discussed the fact that we needed some kind of release form, but we didn't, we hadn't drawn anything up or anything like that. And there's no sense in recreating that bill either. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll give you my card, and uh, we can send you. And like David said, that broadcast release form, and it's a fairly basic form. Yeah. Um, and the, we always like to cover our bases. And the, <laughs> yeah. the, and the contract we gift is, uh, it's a, uh, it really, it really depends on who you're, on who you're dealing with. The donor, you know, some donors they just want to say, "Hey, clean up my house. I want to get, you know, give this to you," and it's pretty straightforward. But others, like uh, photographers or whatnot, really want to recoup on what they're giving to you. So it's more of a legal thing. So, uh, well, thank you. Well, I'd say, say a few things. Um, I'm Dave Pilcher. I've been with the department for um, 28 years, 28 and a third years. Uh, I know that's hard to believe, uh, but um, I started when I was right out, right out of college. I was going to work there for one year, and, and I'm still there. But uh, I am the, as Preston said, the director of the Electronic Archives and Digital Preservation part of the department. And we have actually been a, a, a section since about 2000. We kind of grew out of a grant-funded project. But prior to that, I was the um, director of the Sovereign Commission project that he, he uh, mentioned, which was our really our, our first big experience with imaging. And uh, just to tell you how things have changed, the first two scanners we, we bought for that project, um, you could probably buy now for $100 at Best Buy. They, uh, they cost us $14,500 a piece. Um, those and uh, in storage space, we needed four gigs of extra space on our server. It cost us a thousand dollars in 1995. Now you can you can have 16 gig on a stick in your pocket for ten dollars. <laughs> <So, laughs> but uh, anyway, we um, we handle anything that comes in electronic format, whether it's born digital um, or or whether it's been digitized. Uh, anything that comes from a state agency. Or a, or a private donor that comes in electronic format comes to our section for uh, for preservation and public access. And anything that is digitized in house, as Preston said, from our image and sound unit, um, from our own collections, comes to us for preservation and uh, and public access. Now most things go on the on the internet. It's our intention to put everything on the web that we can. Some things there are um, sometimes there are rights issues with materials that maybe require that we just make them available in-house in a library and uh, sometimes there are issues with state records maybe um, privacy issues that are not necessarily exempted explicitly in, from the public records requirements of the, uh, of the law but might have some issues that make us just feel like we need to just make them available in-house. Uh, the main point of contact our, our entry into our collections is the uh, the online catalog, which is accessible from our website. And um, anything that has been digitized or that's in electronic form and that's available, there's going to be a link in that catalog version. So if you go in, you search by subject, say you search TIPA, and um, it pulls up anything. If, as you go through your catalog records, if you see a link that says link to electronic resource, it'll take you right to it. And uh, the um, digital archives page off of our main web page has a number of featured collections, um, probably 25 or 30 now, maybe, um, that are listed on that front page, just in alphabetical order. And um, then there'll be a link to the government archives page, which has anything that we've received from an agency um, on, that, on that page. And then, of course, through the catalog, you'll find many more things that are to be in one of those places. Um, now, we, um, we actually, one of the first state archives to kind of have a program and, and devote um, as, as much as many resources as, as we have to uh, 
to um, to, to making it, <coughs> making it into something that we can we feel like uh, we could get something done. We've actually got the third largest uh, electronic holdings of any state archives in the country, uh, and uh, so we you know we feel pretty good about that. We feel kind of like we have an idea of what we do it, what we're doing, but um, we all, we know that there's always you know so much more because. Uh, it's, it's a field where everything is just constantly changing and there's new developments and there's never that magic bullet um, solution for what you want to do. You always kind of have to find your own way. And in Mississippi, the funding is not always there to, to, to do what we want, so we have to do everything kind of in an open source, open fashion that we can um, adapt and, and um, always be ready to move on to that next solution if it, if it comes available. Uh, uh, a few things that I wrote down while Preston was talking, just to keep in mind, um, <coughs> as y'all image more and more stuff, um, and, I, and I'm sure you've already got this on your mind, but but you know, preservation and um, and backing your stuff up is just really important. Making sure that you have multiple copies of of, of, of things. Um, now, with preservation, um, you know, you have formats that you think about, and then you just have the actual storage issues and uh, you always you don't ever want to be in a position where you lose things um, because you you know did not have enough redundancy there to, to be able to uh, to uh, get it back and uh, um, just um, I saw upstairs you've got a two terabyte external drive uh, and I'm not sure how you and we can always talk about it and we can always help you if you have questions about um, about preservation and, and redundancy and, and uh, I'm not sure what kind of relationship you have with, um, say, the technical people for the county? Is there a technical person that helps y'all, or, or is there a server? We have, we have we have <laughs> we have a historical society member who is very technically savvy. Okay, I didn't know if you had a uh, if there was say a server in the other house. Okay. okay. Um, you should be looking at the server. Okay. Somebody's grandson that comes from high school on, uh, once a week. <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. Middle school. Middle school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've got a, my, my youngest is, is going to be 14 this week. And, uh, she's a lot better with a lot of things than, than I am. But, um, but, um, and I've got one at Mississippi State who's, who's, who's even better than both things. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, the reason I was asking that, because often if you have a, a relationship, say, with another entity, the county that has a server that might be one place to look for, you know, to, to be able to build on their storage space. Uh, um, but uh, other, in the absence of that, it's just important to, to make sure you don't have, just have things on the, on the computer, you know, to make sure you have them on the external drive. Um, more than one, um, preferably to have, you know, it's, it's good to have things off-site in another location to where um, you, you know, periodically back it up and, and place somewhere where you can can get it. If you have a fire in one location, then you get it somewhere else. Uh, it's a pretty, um, you know, simple thing, basic thing to think about. Um, another thing would be um, um, preservation formats. You know, when you scan, uh, we do have some imaging standards on our website that are really, what they're intended for is um, government entities that are scanning um, records that have been determined by either the State Records Committee or the Local Government Records Committee to, uh, to be of permanent value. Okay, Tim's got them in there. Yeah. And uh, they're available on the website as well. Um, they're really, um, like I say, they're, they're, they're only required by places that are going to throw the, the hard copy away and just keep the image. Uh, other than that, though, they're kind of a good, good place to start and get some basic mm -hmm. information about uh, preservation mm -hmm. formats. Uh, you know, we, we talk about TIFF and and uh, PDF in there, and um, and uh, of course, uh, you know what we do um, <coughs> when something is digitized in house. We're going to start out you know, with a preservation TIFF image, and uh, for preserva um, for presentation on the web, um, you know we're going to uh, do whatever we need to. Often we put up uh, what we call Zoomify um, JPEGs, which it, we, we use a utility uh, called Zoomify, which allows us to. Uh, actually zoom the image um, on the screen and, and, and when, it's, when it's presented. And that, you know, that can be a, um, 
we often have different resolution JPEGs available for, uh, for viewing on the site. Uh, but that pre preservation image is back there always you know, safe and backed up on the, on the server. Um, and that image <coughs> on the website is not copyable. Um, sometimes it is, but more yeah. often it's not. And, and really, we're mainly interested, what we're interested in is presenting the best image and, and being able to uh, have the best zoom capability that we can. Um, and um, often that keeps you from being able to have something that you can you know, get a good printout of. Um, but we also, uh, we, we can uh, um, make available and um, sell at a pretty low cost uh, copies of, uh, of the TIFFs for people. And uh, we have a digital deliverable system that allows people the option of just having it emailed to them if they would like, uh, or, um, or they can put it on a disk, uh, however, however somebody wants it. Um, the other thing, the Preston <coughs> talked a little bit about just being uh, really um, prepared when you start uh, a project. Uh, he mentioned the, the need for a flatbed. Uh, when, when we originally started imaging, uh, you know, it was the Sonic Mission documents were uh, you know, kind of a time capsule of things that covered 1956 through 73. So you had all of the different uh, um, technologies that were in use at the time for producing documents. You had Thermofax, you had onion skin paper, um, you had a lot of um, you know, green ledger paper, uh, and a lot of, just, just looking at it, if we had not spent a whole lot of time inventorying the stuff and thinking about what the judge was making us do, um, we probably wouldn't have um, you know, been able to um, kind of pinpoint exactly what we needed for those materials. Um, because you, um, you, you know, you, if, if you're prepared up front and you get a good flatbed scanner like, like he was talking about, that, um, that Epson 10,000, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's going to give you so much more capability than, than a lot of things that, that you see. And, and um, you know, you, you see automatic feeders on scanners, and of course you know that that's, uh, that's not a possibility for a lot of the types of materials that, that you're going to find uh, that come in the door and that you want. And um, also um, put a lot of thought into uh, indexing. Uh, you know, what's your, Preston used the word metadata. I try to stay away from that word just because it, it scares a lot of people. I just call it descriptive information because that's really all we're talking about is the information that helps you know what you've scanned and, and, um, and help somebody get to it. And uh, we, um, we are pretty flexible. We, we use a, a a standardized scheme. It's called the Dublin Core Metadata Scheme. Uh, it's been around for, for years. It's 15 basic elements. We always tell people that we're a flexible Dublin Core metadata shop, <laughs> but we're we're really really flexible on it. Um, we um, we just try to do whatever the project requires and you know kind of do the smart thing. And uh, once they transfer a photograph collection, generally they're going to have. Um, metadata that they enter, uh, and sometimes we'll create a small database for them to do it, but we'll take it in, in an Excel spreadsheet or, or, or you know, just a Word file, whatever, a Word table, whatever we can get, uh, as long as we have it in a, in a form that we can match up with that image and, uh, and make sure that um, we have everything where it needs to be, and then we have a second layer of cataloging that um, adds subject information and, and helps people get to it. But really, that's... Um, that's the most important thing to remember is just really being prepared up front. One other thing I'll mention, uh, I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with the Mississippi Digital Library. It is a, um, it's a group that started um, with a kind of a core group of images, uh, I mean uh, institutions, USM primarily, us, uh, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, uh, Delta State is involved. Uh, I think uh, Tougaloo is, is semi-involved and, and uh, but it's grown beyond that to include regional libraries and um, other libraries and um, some historical societies. And uh, they will, if you're interested in, in uh, having a different way to, to make something available on the web, um, they will actually work with you. Um, basically, they have a pretty simple um, metadata form that you can, you can send them your, your images, give them the, the data they'll need to uh, put it up. And, they will put it up in a, um, I don't know if you're familiar with ContentDM, it's a, uh, it's kind of a digital asset management um, 
system that you've probably seen if you've gone to any academic library's website where they have collections. Um, it, it would look familiar to you. But they, uh, we don't use it at our place, but they, uh, they can take materials and load them into the system. And uh, anyone can go there, they can click. Say if you had, tip, if Tippa County Historical Society was there, they would give you a logo. Someone can click on it and see what you have added. Or they can do a comprehensive keyword search of the whole thing and it will pull up any materials that you've loaded there. So that would be one option. Do they do that for historical museums as well? Because I've put a lot of old photos on my site and people have identified you know, people on there under the chat sections um, and, okay. um, yeah, I think and done um, a lot of research that way as well. I don't think they have any hard and fast rules about, um, you know, that would prohibit any, any certain group from being a part of it. I think that they're, they'll um, talk to you about what you have. And, May I have their email address before you leave? Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just have to give it to you from memory, or you can, uh, you can. I think it's uh, well. I'm gonna try to give you the address. I think it's just MDL. But um, if you Google Mississippi Digital Library, um, you should okay. you should find it pretty easily. Okay. Um, I can do that. And once you get on the site, you'll see the logos for the different institutions. We don't have any content that's directly available through there. What you'll find on there for us is just a link to our site because okay. um, because we have so much that um, we were kind of um, concerned at the beginning that we didn't want to um, overwhelm anybody with our content while these smaller collections were, were um, being built. But USM has done a lot of digitization. Mississippi State has done a lot more in recent years. And, uh, Ole Miss has some, some really good stuff. You know, they're, they're heavy on the uh, uh, Civil War and uh, Confederate um, soldier collections. And and, uh, and they also, um, they have something similar to something we're about to put out. One thing to look for from us, um, in the coming several months, we've got about 7,000 school photographs that are going to go up from six different collections. Um, and a lot of them were generated in the 1950s when they were they had to do uh, surveys that were mandated by, by law um, right after Brown versus Board of Education. And um, they, they um, you got pictures of schools in, in really every county in the state. I think there's one county that um, doesn't have any photographs. It's not Tim. It's, uh, I think it's Carol. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, that's, that's something good that we have coming. And uh, Preston mentioned the, the, the GSU folks, um, they enabled having an agreement with them to scan some of the bigger materials that we have um, really enabled us to put up some, some good genealogical things in the last few years, uh, including the gender pension applications, the uh, about 200,000 um, educable children record images, and, um, and all of these were available on their side as well. Um, we have finished getting everything up that they scanned for us. So it's all there. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, sir. Uh, what type of digital electronic uh, electronic genealogical files do y'all accept? Um, accept? Yeah. We'll, um, we will pretty much accept anything. Um, if anybody, um, I mean, I, I, I've never turned anything down <laughs> from anyone. Uh, we have, um, we routinely have people, I just recently <coughs> received some, some DAR chapter records from uh, from Hazel Hurst that someone gave us. Uh, Sam Price from Vicksburg, who was a, uh, a, um, a very active researcher in two lines, um, um, Masonic history, and, uh, and also, um, oh, anything having to do with Warren County and, um, and, uh, and, and railroads in particular. He, we, we received a ton of stuff from him that, that he, uh, he just put together himself. So, Basically, what we'll do is we will um, just get you to sign a contract of gift if you have something. And, and um, that contract, as Preston said, um, has check boxes on it that allows somebody to, um, if they feel like they have a copyright interest in it, they can sign that over. They can they can say on there that they do not sign that over, but they won't give it to us anyway. And uh, and that um, will kind of let us know what we can do as far as making. Yes. Well, enjoy.
coming up here today. Let me make one quick comment. Uh, as they were talking, I was thinking, we've, we've worked, like I said, we've done uh, 65 counties, I believe, so we've, uh, with the inventories, and so we've dealt with historical societies in some of the other counties. Uh, Lauderdale County, which is Meridian, has a partnership with their historical society. They have the old Lamar Hotel right across from the courthouse that they've turned a lot of that into county offices. And up on second floor is Lauderdale County Archives. There's one full-time county employee, and then there are several uh, volunteers from the historical society that help man the place. They have a lot of the old county records, but they also have uh, genealogies and historical information, cemetery lists and things like that that they've compiled over the years and they sell those to people that come in, uh, those lists to people that come in to do research or they can they have it on their website uh, so that they're actually generating money from this. They operate that office mainly from the money that's generated on uh, selling this information. On a smaller scale, you can look over in uh, Senatobia, Tate County. Uh, they have a building uh, there in the courthouse, well, right next to the courthouse. It's the uh, superintendent of education is in one part of the office. They've got a place upstairs, and then they've got a big storeroom downstairs with uh, your records are in a lot better organized than theirs. So they know everything that they've got, but they're not organized so well. But they also have a website, and they, um, you know, do pretty much the same thing on, on a different scale. So you might talk with uh, Gail Tomlinson is the contact there. She was actually president of the Histo Mississippi Historical Society a couple of years ago. Uh, contact them. Uh, Ward Calhoun is the county employee that works for Lauderdale County, and you can go to the county website and find Lauderdale County archives there. You might get, just talking with them, you might get some ideas on how uh, this place here can actually generate some money for you. Yes, ma'am. At the museum, people have brought in um, all kinds of media to me. And as a museum, I don't feel like I should be a media storage, but I have right. stored them anyway because I don't, <coughs> I can't throw them away. Yeah, uh, what kinds of media should go into an archives? I have newspapers, one from the 1700s. I have, um, I have magazines. I have newspapers. I have Reader's Digest from back way, way, way back in the day. And I have pictures. I have diplomas. I have. Um, graduation pictures, big ones like they hung in oh, the school no. buildings. No. I have all kinds of things and they're stacked right now on top of my kitchen cabinets because I have no place to put them. Right. And uh, what would those kinds of things go into the archives? The things that would be unique would. Now, with, with a newspaper, um, first of all, you want to want to make sure that it's relevant to your location. And that's one of the things that you want to do with, with both a, a archives and a museum. Determine your um, concept, your mission. Come up with a mission statement that said this is what we're going to do. And there may be some things that you may have to reject or throw away, as hard as it is, I know. But if they don't fit into your mission statement, then it's, you know, you're going to end up with a lot of junk. Now, like the, the graduation pictures, they're going to be unique. Uh, that would be something, you know, years down the road people would be interested in. Uh, copies of Reader's Digest you could probably get in 400 different places. So that one, you know, that that's not unique. Uh, but look at things that that advance the cause of your of your museum or your archives and things. Things that people, <coughs> more than just, oh, that's interesting, but will this actually be helpful to someone down the road? Uh, 
the format, you know, that might be another thing. You're not going to scan a giant, you know, 12, <laughs> 12 foot wide photograph. And in you know. the process I'm going through right now is I'm trying to, there's, I have a million pictures. Yeah. And I'm trying to shrink them into an 8 by 10 laminate the pictures and then oh don't laminate please no well i'm sorry mylar the pictures the act the, the originals yes. and then laminate the copies and put them in what i call look boxes so people can take them up and look at them and, with their hands but yeah. store the others the originals yeah but i'm running out of storage for them would, your, would those pictures go in the archives what's the name of what's the museum what's the museum that you're it's the Tippa County Historical Museum. There are people from Tippa County that have yeah. donated these things. And it's just It's just few right down here. If you want to go see house. it, I'll be happy to take you down I, I've here. been there once. Oh, okay. Yes. And you have a whole lot more than you've got room for. No. Yes, <laughs> we do. And I really need to get some of the media out because we, the museum is supposed to have items, not... Yeah. Paper and pictures. Is that something that that um, the archive could take in terms of the Well, photograph? that's what I'm asking you. Is that something archives are supposed to have? The photographs, yeah. Photographs and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say archives, you mean the archives here? Uh huh. Okay. I'm make sure you didn't mean us. Because, uh, <laughs> is that something they're supposed to do? Oh, yeah. But now I have them. I mean, I have them at the museum. They're in, you know, like I said, they're at Mylar. I've, I've bought the, the expense of Mylaring them and copying them and everything. What kind of, what are, what's the subject matter in regards to the photograph? Uh, people from the county who have brought in pictures of their ancestors and it's like uh, scrapbooks or single photographs uh, most of them are single photographs some of them are photographs of people in front of old buildings in the county uh, some of them are pictures like of the just is people who were in the war uh, World War One, World War Two. Um, some old photographs that they've forgotten who the people were because their family didn't write the name on the back of the picture, but I have the picture. Um, but it is this People region. from this county have brought them to me. And it's of this region. And it's of this county, people from this yeah. county, supposedly. Okay. Sounds like a pretty good treasure. Yep. Sound like what? Like a pretty good treasure. Pretty good, like a pretty good collection. Yeah. Um, if, What would you do with yeah. photographs that are not identified, yeah. that you can't identify? Uh, um, what would you do with them? Well, um, I mean, if you... Well, what I was going to say, a lot of people now, we, we've been putting more and more stuff on Flickr. We have a mm -hmm. part of what's called Flickr Commons on, the, on um, where the, our institutional account is, a Flickr's Commons account, and, and we, um, we have had a number of people identify um, folks and, and pictures. We, we've kind of had a steady stream since we started putting up images. Like, for instance, we have one image that is just um, all about Crystal Springs and tomato farming and Kapai County. And uh, it's called the Hamilton Collection. And we've had a, we, when we put it up, we had a number of people contact us and say, I can tell you who that is. And, and um, you know, if it, if it seemed like they knew what they, they were talking about, we would go ahead and put that on the site. And it's, it's happened more and more with Flickr because so many more people go to Flickr and they can put their comment on there. And, um, on Flickr? And, yeah. Flickr okay, I don't even have an account with them. I don't even know how to use it, but I'll okay. learn. Yeah. <laughs> I will uh, learn. Yeah, there's, just, there's a Facebook page, too, that's called Genealogy Lost and Found, where you can oh. post.